hi everybody, uh, I'm Ilan. And before I start the talk, I want to wish everybody a happy Labor Day. And uh, to mention that today is also Yom HaZikaron, which is the Israeli Memorial Day for the fallen soldiers uh, of terror attacks and uh, wars. So happy holidays and let's remember all the fallen, all the fallen soldiers. And now I'll begin the talk. Uh, so this is joint work with Gil Sege from the Hebrew, Hebrew University. Uh, and let me get to it. So we just heard what functional encryption is. Uh, it's just a standard encryption scheme which, is, which allows Alice that has a public key to encrypt messages. And uh, the additional functionality that functional encryption gives us is that the holder of the master secret key can generate keys for functions that allow uh, somebody that has a ciphertext and a key for the function to evaluate, uh, the value, evaluate the function on the underlying ciphertext, but without learning anything new about what is encrypted inside the, the ciphertext. Uh, we'll be talking a lot about the private key uh, notion of functional encryption, uh, which we think uh, about in, slightly, in a slightly different scenario, where there is a holder of a master secret key and there's a database or a server uh, that stores uh, ciphertext sent by uh, the user that holds the master secret key. The server, uh, when he has only the ciphertext, knows nothing, of course, about uh, whatever is encrypted underneath. But the holder of the master secret key can generate a key for a specific function of its choice, uh, delegate it to the server, send it to the server, and the server will be able to uh, compute the function f of uh, whatever is encrypted inside the ciphertext, but without learning anything except it. It's a very useful notion. And here's a, an, a, a simple example of what we can do with it. Uh, it's something I call positivity revealing encryption. So as long as the server has only ciphertext that in, encodes some messages, he doesn't know anything about what's inside. But once Alice generates a key for a function which is just the greater than zero, then the server can compute whether the encrypted uh, message is of a message which is greater than zero or not, which is something it couldn't do before. Uh, the security that we'll be relying on is what we call indistinguishability-based security. And it says that the server give, is given a list of functions, f1 to fl, and he sees a bunch of ciphertext corresponding to messages m1 to mk. He'll be able to learn fi on, of mj for any i and any j, but nothing else. And the nothing else is the standard indistinguishability-based uh, security notion. Uh, what do we know about this primitive? Uh, we know quite a lot about it, and the highlights are the following three constructions. Uh, there's a very simple construction, or a very, it's of the sort of garbled circuits and stuff like that, uh, that gives you some sort, of, uh, some sort of limited functionality, and specifically it gives us a bounded number of, of uh, functional keys, and the ciphertexts are quite long in some sense, and in the private key setting, we know how to do it based on any one-way function. And in the pri public key setting, we know how to do it based on any public key encryption scheme. If we want to somehow make the ciphertext shorter, in some sense, which I will not explain, then we know how to do it from LWE. And we have the perfect construction based on I.O., uh, which gives us an unbounded number of keys and very short ciphertext, and it's a very, very neat construction. And the question that we care about in this work is, is I.O. necessary to construct functional encryption schemes with unbounded number of keys? It seems like this is the only way we know how to construct it, so is it necessary? So let's see what we know about uh, this question. So in the public key setting, we know that public key functional encryption is essentially equivalent to I.O. Uh, I mentioned those works of uh, Anant and Jane and Bitansky and Van Kutanathan. In the private key setting, up until recently, we didn't know anything except that they imply just one-way functions. Uh, and we have a, a, at least some limitation result telling us that black box constructions will not give us anything better than one-way functions. This is the work of uh, Asharov and Segev. Uh, a very recent work from half a year ago uh, of Bitansky et al. showed that if you take a private key functional encryption scheme and combine it with very strong one-way functions, then we somehow get public encryption. 
which is kind of surprising at the time it was. And they had another result that if you take a private key functional encryption and add a public key encryption, then we get all I.O. So that kind of, uh, kind of uh, answers the question, but they have additional assumptions. For example, the private key functional encryption scheme needs some public key primitive. It needs a public key encryption scheme. Uh, and of course, they somehow bypass the bl black box barrier of uh, Ashalov and Sekev, and the non-black component is a previous work of uh, Brakerovsky, myself, and Gil, and Sekev from last year's crypto. Um, okay, so what do we know? Uh, basically, the world looks as follows. We want to construct an I.O. scheme, and I will try to explain uh, which, what kind of I.O. we can construct from, uh, from any primitive, and we, I will talk about a bounded input I.O., which says how many inputs can it support, how, the length of what inputs can it support. So an I.O. scheme that supports only logarithmic number of inputs is trivial to construct, right? You just write the truth table. It has no applications and it's trivial to construct. I.O. that supports polynomial length inputs it gives us all applications of I.O. and we know how to construct it based on public EFE or a private EFE and public encryption. This is what I just said. In last year's uh, Eurocrypt, uh, we had the paper showing how to construct just from private key FE an IO scheme that supports slightly more than logarithmic number of inputs. And as an application, Bitansky et al. showed that if you add very strong one-way functions, then you get public key encryption scheme from this primitive. <coughs> and the main result in this work is a construction based just on quasi-polynomially secure private key FE we construct an I.O. scheme which supports a polylogarithmic number of inputs. The, the length of the inputs that it supports is log to the one plus delta for some fixed constant delta times n. And we show that as an application, if you add sub-exponentially secure one-way functions, then we can, get, we can get not only public encryption, but actually a public key functional encryption. And we can also get other applications of I.O. such as PPAD hardness, and more. So this is the main result. This is just uh, saying it again more exactly. So we construct the main result, the main theorem we're gonna talk about is a construction of IO for circuits that have polylog many inputs based on quasi-polynomially secure functional encryption. And we have two applications that I mentioned. And recently, last week, uh, Kitagawa, Nishimaki, and Tanaka uploaded the paper uh, proving that private key FE implies full-fledged I.O. It seems it improves uh, over our theorem, but their techniques are completely different. And uh, I think this is um, still interesting. Uh, so let's see what, what the applications gives us, at least in terms of assumptions. Uh, PPAD hardness is a very important question. I will not define what it is, but it is, it is very important. And what we know so far is, cons is constructions based on strong assumptions, VVB, IO, public EFE. And our work shows that basically you can get the same application, PPAD hardness, but based just on private key FE with quasi-polynomial security. And a very cool open question, which is uh, on this matter exactly, to prove hardness based on weaker assumptions. I think that's a very important question. So let's dive into our construction and proof. So we, we, wo we work using uh, the notion of a multi-input functional encryption scheme. This is an underlying primitive, and let me define what a two-input functional encryption is. So it's very similar to a single input uh, functional encryption uh, in, a, in a private key setting where there's a player Alice that has a master secret key. It can encrypt messages, M1, M2, M3, and so on, and send them to the server. And at some point in time, it can also generate a key for a function F, but now the function F gets not a single message as input, but two inputs as input. 
so the server can learn f of m1 and m2 for every ciphertext of m1 and m2. And a very nice application of this notion is what is known as order revealing encryption, which allows the server to learn which ciphertext is greater than the other, which ciphertext encodes a message which is greater than the other. This thing is uh, very useful in searchable encryption and has many applications. And you can also generalize this definition to a t-input scheme, where the function gets t-inputs as input. So what do we know how to do, uh, how, how to get a t-input scheme? So we know, uh, based on the work of Goldwasser uh, from a couple of years ago, that we can do, th that this primitive exists based on I.O. Uh, Bonnet et al. had a construction based on multilinear maps. Uh, Anant Jain and Vitansky Vukontanathan had the work based on public key FE. Last year we obtained a construction of this primitive based on private key FE, but the number of inputs we could support was limited to log log to double doubly logarithmic. And in this work we can support a polylogarithmic number of inputs. <coughs> Let's see how this primitive is related to I.O. Basically what we show is that private key FE implies I.O. Uh, this is the main theorem. Private key FE implies I.O. with uh, circuits for of poly polylogarithmic input size. And the way we do it as is that we show a generic transformation from any T input functional encryption scheme to a 2T input functional encryption scheme. So we start with a private key functional encryption scheme make it a two it in, it make it a two input functional encryption scheme and then a four and then eight and so on and so forth until we get to log to the delta number of inputs and then we take this primitive and show that it's equivalent to IO with log to the one plus delta inputs. <coughs> okay, let's see how the last step is done. The last step we said is that a T input private key functional encryption scheme implies uh, I.O. for circuits of length T times log of N, of inputs so of T times log N. How this is done? So we want to construct an obfuscator based on the private key functional encryption scheme. The, obfusca the obfuscation of a circuit C is very simple. It's just a key for a function, a, a key for the circuit, plus we'll have a ciphertext encoding all messages of length, length logarithmic each one corresponding to a different index in the multi-input scheme. So SK sub C is the key for the function C, and CTIJ is a ciphertext that encrypting the, the string I with respect to input J. And to evaluate, it's very easy. You take the key for the function, you take the ciphertext, of, the ciphertext that you want to evaluate on, and you can get the value of the circuit that's, uh, th that's given immediately based on the correctness of the functional encryption scheme. Security is proven quite easily. It's also quite immediate, especially if you assume that the functional encryption scheme is function private, something we can get gener generically. So we basically know now that a T input functional encryption scheme implies I.O. for circuits uh, that have T times log N number of inputs. So we are left to show how we construct a 2T input functional encryption scheme based on a T input functional encryption scheme, and this will finish the job. So we start with, an, uh, with a functional encryption scheme that supports T uh, inputs. The master secret key will be just a master secret key for the functional encryption scheme and a pair of key. When we want to generate a key for a function that gets 2T inputs, uh, we generate a key for a function that gets only T inputs, and it has hardwired the PRF key K. What it does is it generates a new master secret key for the T input scheme that depends on all the T inputs that it got as input, and it generates a new key that will get later the second part of the input, the other T inputs. When we want to encrypt an input X corresponding to an index I, we will just encrypt it using the previous scheme. 
And when we want to encrypt an input Y, which is of the second part, we'll generate again a key for a function that we call AGG for aggregator. And the key for the function will have Y hardwired inside and the same PRF key. It will generate again the same master secret key for the T input scheme and output a ciphertext of Y under this, uh, under this master secret key. It's sort of a re-encryption uh, circuit. Okay, this is the full scheme. So let me repeat what's going on here. We want to construct a 2T input scheme based on a T input scheme. Uh, the T input scheme supports functions of T inputs. So we can generate keys only for T inputs and we can encrypt uh, messages only for, uh, only for T indices. So the first T indices will treat them as standard indices in the T input scheme. And the last T inputs will generate keys for the AGG function, which allows us to re-encrypt the cipher, re-encrypt the message based on a master secret key that depends on X1 to XT. And the same master secret key will be generated by the gen function when we generate a functional key. How is decryption done? Decryption is done in the following way. We generate a, a secret key that corresponds to the function f star, which, has, which is just f with x1 to xt hardwired inside, given uh, all these ciphertexts. Then we will generate a new ciphertext for every y, for every y ciphertext, which is the ciphertext of the same message, but under a new key. And then we'll combine uh, F star with CT prime and CT, with all the CT primes. So this is how decryption is done. More pictorially, it looks something as follows. We get a, a key for a function F, and we get T ciphertext corresponding to the first T inputs, and T ciphertext corresponding to the last T inputs. We'll call them CTX1 to CTXT, and CTY1 to CTYT. We first take the key for the function f and all the ciphertext corresponding to x1 until x, xt and generate a new key for the same function f, but now it has hardwired x1 to xt and it is under a key that depends on x1 to xt. Then we'll take all the ciphertext corresponding to x1 and xt and take the key, which is the ciphertext of, uh, which is a ciphertext of y it's a functional key for the function that takes all, CT, all x1 to xt and generates a new encryption of y under the key that depends on x1 to xt. So we get ct prime y1. We'll do the same for every y and we'll get uh, ct yt prime. And now we take again the key of f, prime, f star with the ciphertext of y1 until yt and get the value of f on x1 until xt uh, and y1 until yt. Okay, so this is how decryption is done or evaluation. Uh, the proof of security is as follows. So the high level idea of the proof of security is to get rid somehow of the PLF key. That's the only secret we have basically uh, in, in all the functional keys. So we need to somehow get rid of uh, the functional key, uh, the PRF key. The, I, the technical, uh, technical challenge is, uh, is to get rid of the PRF key and we do it using uh, puncturable PRFs, function privacy, and lots and lots of hybrids. Uh, the idea of the proof is to attack each X1 to XT separately. So we somehow have a, a sequence of hybrids each one attacking x, uh, each x1 to xt separately. And the idea is to take uh, in every ciphertext corresponding to a y, which is a key for a function, the AGG function, will hardwire ahead of time the ciphertext uh, under the master secret key that depends on x1 to xt. And we'll do the same in the, key, in the functional key for f. We'll uh, hardwire inside ge the gen uh, function the secret key of f sub x1 to xt 
with, uh, with, with, and then we, we will not need the, the PRF key, basically. Uh, that's the proof idea and the question. Questions? Uh, so you are able to just log to the delta times. Can you explain what the limitations are that lead to that bound? Yeah. Uh, the ciphertext blows up polynomially at every at every iteration of this uh <coughs> of this transformation. So we cannot do it too many times. Uh, that's basically the reason. 